In the distant past, laryngeal examination was felt to be of questionable value. The evaluation of an individual with a hoarse voice was confined to an inspection of the mouth and pharynx. The examiner then placed a finger in the mouth over the tongue base to palpate the epiglottis. Seeing the living larynx was impossible. Even when it was seen at cadaver dissection, the two small folds on the sides of the laryngopharynx were felt to have scant bearing on vocal tract symptoms. In the second century of the Christian era, the anatomist Galen, who was personal physician to Marcus Aurelius, wrote a lengthy treatise on the voice, now unfortunately lost. He seems to have recognized the vocal folds as the source for voiced. Detailed laryngeal examination of the living larynx began about a hundred years ago with the invention of the laryngeal mirror by Manuel Garcia, a singing teacher. To him we owe the beginnings of the current science of laryngology. We still use Garcia's mirror in the office practice of laryngology. The subject is seated facing the examiner who usually uses a reflective mirror as the light source. Garcia's mirror is placed in the oropharynx and the tongue is thrust out and retained by the examiner. The reflection of the larynx is thus seen in the mirror. This technique is still a fundamental one. Its major disadvantage is that it permits only the E vowel, for all other sounds entail movements which change the vocal tract from its straightest position. A new examining instrument, the flexible laryngoscope, overcomes many of these problems. This new examining instrument consists basically of a flexible fiber optic light fiber carrying bundle. It's roughly a quarter of an inch in diameter. To the bundle then is attached the handpiece, a knob up here which as you can see angles the tip of the scope for movability and for maneuverability and the eyepiece. Light, incidentally, for the instrument is supplied through this long flexible fiber optic light carrier cable. Through it, again, light comes down into the scope, out the tip of the flexible tube, and then ultimately the image travels back up the flexible tube through the body of the scope to the eyepiece and ultimately to the television camera. The nose of the subject is then anesthetized and after anesthesia and con decongestion has been secured, the flexible bundle is introduced along the floor. The tip is then angled so that it will pass the curve of the soft palate and come to lie in the patient's pharynx behind the uvula and, as you can see here, looking down on the larynx. In a moment, we'll show you the scope in position in a subject with camera attached so you can have some idea of what that configuration is. I'm looking now across on the other side of the room and at my television monitor screen. 
I'll bend the tip of the scope as it goes over my soft palette and then as I visualize where I am and what I'm doing, I'm now in view of my larynx and the structures around the larynx. This direct examination produces an accurate front-to-back anatomical picture so far as the laryngeal images are concerned. In the video sequences which will follow, this same perspective will then apply. The usual or customary laryngeal picture will appear to you to be upside down to the textbook illustrations since this which you are now seeing is the way in which it actually does appear and actually is situated anatomically with respect to the examiner. Therefore, please note in the ensuing sequences for these structures. First of all, you will notice the tongue base which will appear toward the bottom of the television screen. Next, you will notice the relatively horizontally placed epiglottis and then firmly attached anteriorly toward the tongue base toward the bottom of the television screen will be the anterior commissure. The two vocal folds will then move from side to side from lateral to medial by the action of the two arytenoid mounds. The majority of the action which you will see in these television sequences which follow will concern arytenoid movement and vocal fold movement. But again, let me repeat. Epiglottis will be toward the bottom of the television screen as will the anterior commissure. These structures are the vocal folds, and these are the arytenoid mounds. They're all surrounded, incidentally, and finally, by the entire pharyngeal wall. Now take a look at some of this anatomy that we've been talking about. The scope is lying in the floor of the nose. The nasal septum is to the right of the screen. To the left is the inferior turbinate. The scope is advanced along the nose, and as it is, the soft palate now at the floor of the screen, or at the bottom of the screen, comes in view. You can see just to the right the angle made by the posterior end of the nasal septum, the wall which divides the nose into right and left sides. Directly ahead is the nasopharyngeal wall, the upper end of the pharyngeal wall. Notice, incidentally, that the vowel sounds are all made with a closed palate as A, E, I, O, U. Listen to those same sounds made with an open palate. A, E, I, O, U. There is palatal movement then, but it is not a complete closure. Now let's go over the palate, make the bend, and first of all, at the floor of the screen, you see the mo moving epiglottis, which lies in a relatively horizontal direction just below the, or let's back up. Above, at the top of the screen, 
is the pharyngeal wall. Between the pharyngeal wall and the epiglottis is seen the paired arytenoid cartilages and between them the vocal cords. Let's go a little closer and look at the vocal cords, or the vocal folds rather, more closely. E, 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 E. Again, you can see the arytenoid cartilages approximating somewhat firmly, and then the vocal folds beneath. He, 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 he. Looking between the vocal folds, we are looking down into the trachea. Now let's back out again, reviewing as we go pharyngeal wall at the top of the screen, the epiglottis should be there. Next we'll withdraw to the level of the soft palate, there. And now let's go back into the nose, as we are doing here. Soft palate, a mucous strand going from soft palate to septum, and then finally, out. First, let's look at the epiglottis. It can be open and shaped like a shoehorn blade, or it can be curled up upon itself in an omega shape, or anywhere in between. The epiglottic shape seems to have little or no effect on singing voice. Dr. David Brewer of Syracuse feels that redness at the base of the epiglottis may indicate vocal strain. Next, let's look at some retinoids. These, too, have different shapes and contours. Most premier singers seem to have relatively vertically oriented ones, although this is variable. Some laryngologists feel that horizontally placed arytenoids may indicate vocal strain. Certainly, this young lady of 14 seems to be straining as she ascends in pitch. Let's listen to her for a moment. Vocal folds are usually white in high range voices, the soprano and the tenor. <laughs> Lower pitched voices usually are slightly pink, as in the mezzo or the baritone. As the voice ascends in pitch, the vocal folds become stretched out or pulled out, and they lengthen. For lower pitches, they are shorter and thicker. 
that again. E I go up a step. E e again. E e okay. The untrained voice, very audibly, shifts gears when it changes from modal or speaking range to falsetto. The arytenoids clamp together firmly and less effective length of the vocal folds vibrates. <laughs> Trained voices have the gear shifting trained out so that ideally the sound is seamless from bottom to top. In the highest range, the top notes of the trained voice, the folds do not approximate firmly but simply come near each other and almost touch. Here is a high speed sequence of Dr. Hirano's which shows that particular action. In falsetto, the vocal cord is thin. The wave-like movement of the mucosa is poor, and there is no complete closure of the glottis. The vocal cord movement is rather simple. <laughs> Singers' laryngees get sick. The voice in acute laryngitis sounds hoarse and breathy. The folds seem to stick together and pull apart like adhesive tape. The light reflecting from the upper surface of the folds gives a pebbled or bumpy impression. October the 8th. Okay. Now let's say he. Take a breath. Continued hard use of the voice in those situations produces swelling near the anterior commissure, which progresses and can involve most of the vibrating length of the folds. Now, he, he, no, match pitch with me. He, he, higher in pitch. He, he take a breath. Now, he, he, don't move anything and let me sneak down on you. Take a breath. He, he, take a breath. He, he. Hard and continuous use can cause localized swellings at the junction of the anterior and middle thirds, the point of maximal vibration. And if it continues, it can cause nodules, which are dense and firm. Now, he, he, breathe. He, he, breathe. He, he, breathe. Okay. From coughing or from shouting, blood vessels can break within the substance of the vocal fold and produce local bruising. Continued voice use in the presence of a bruised cord or a bruised fold can cause a localized polyp to form.
Thick, dry mucus can accumulate on the vocal folds and can interfere with phonation. Throat clearing is a bad idea because it presses the arretinoids tightly together and can make them red. Now again. He, he, Take a breath. He, he, now clear for me. <coughs> no, not a, try not a cough, but try Sorry. a clear. <coughs> From pressing his arretinoids together, this man may have early ulceration of the membrane overlying the vocal process of his arretinoid. Hold back and take a breath when you need to and keep going. This next lady had a breathing tube in place while she was unconscious for several days. She then formed a blob of proud flesh or granulation tissue over her ulcerated arretinoid. Say that. Today's date is the 21st. Of October. October. Uh -huh. Now, I want, let me, don't swallow, don't breathe, just be real, uh, breathe, but be real still. Chin up a trifle higher. Now, I want you to go. Can you see that flopping business over there on the left side of the screen? That yes. thing that flops? That's yes. what we're talking about. Now, I want you to, to say, one, two, three, sucking air in like that. One, two, three. Now, let This next young woman had a similar problem. Her granuloma has now been removed four times. And now, let's give me a very easy, mm -hmm. take a breath. Let's bring your chin up just a trifle. And that's there. The next sequence is of a man who has a papilloma or a laryngeal wart, and it's caused by a virus. His papilloma has now been removed four times with laser surgery. His vocal fold on the right of the screen is now clear of papilloma. Do this though for me first. <laughs> we, you and I both, need to follow Dr. Brodnitz's advice and Keep your voice healthy so that you too can sing like this. Or perhaps you might even sing like this previously undiscovered voice. Cocaine, bill, and morphine sue Walking down the avenue two by two Hey, honey, won't you have a little on me? Have a on me? Yeah. Oh, 
Lieber 